Alright, lesson 5.2, Properties of Functions, Part 1, and I'm also going to deal with 5.4, Graphing of Data, in this lesson. I've broken 5.2 into two parts because it's uh, quite large and there's a lot of different things that we need to accomplish. So, um, you'll have to watch both of them for this section. So, let's get started here. A function, one of my favorite words because you can't say function without saying fun, is a special type of relation where each element in the first set is associated with exactly one element in the second set. All right. So, the set of first elements of a function is called the domain. And the domain are essentially your x values. And we can define these even further and say that they're your independent values. So in science, you've likely talked about independent values so far. The set of related second elements of the function is called the range. And the range is represented as y values. And of course, if the domain is independent, these then are your dependent values or variables. Okay. So we're going to look at uh, an example here. Okay, example one. Here are two different ways to relate vehicles and the number of wheels each has. So for instance, right here we see is the number of wheels on it. So we're mapping one, which is the number of wheels, to uh, the different type of vehicles that we have. So for instance, one maps onto unicycle because it has one wheel. Two maps onto bicycle and motorcycle because it has two wheels. Three goes to the tricycle and four goes to the bicycle. On the other side here, what we see is we have has the number of wheels. So this is just the opposite way. We have the bicycle uh, maps on to two, the car maps on to four wheels, the motorcycle also maps on to two, and the tricycle goes on to three. Now you might think this is, um, these aren't really any different, but there is some subtle differences that I want us to uh, investigate here. All right. So the first one here on the left-hand side, this diagram does not represent a function because there is an element in the domain and that specific element that I'm looking at is 2 all right um, that is associated with two elements in the second set. So you can never have a number right here map on to two different things. That basically makes it not a function. The diagram on the other side we would say represents a function because each element in the domain domain being our first, so this would be your domain range over here, this is your domain, this is your range over here, is associated with only one, and that's the key part, element in the range. So if you look over here, every one of these that's in the domain maps onto one in the range. All right, so that's what makes it a function. This one is, this one is not. All right. Next thing they want us to do is display as a set of ordered pairs. So we do this, we would use uh, our braces to start there. We would say one goes on to the unicycle. And we'll close that one up. Next one we have is two belongs to the bicycle. 2 belongs to the motorcycle. Uh, what else we got? 3 belongs to the tricycle. And lastly, 4 belongs to the car. Now the part that I want to highlight right here is the fact that whenever you see two of these same things, the two essentially your x values that are the same in a uh, set of ordered pairs, that tells you that you do not have a function. All right? On the other side, we will notice that this never happens. So whatever you're going to see here first, when, for instance, we had bicycle first, there's not going to be another bicycle. Or the next one I have is car. There's not going to be another car. Okay. Motorcycle has 
has two wheels. What else we got here? Tricycle has three wheels. And the last one, unicycle, has one wheel. Notice that each element in the first part of the ordered pair there has a different one in the second part. So we would say that that is a function. All right. So the set of ordered pairs do not represent a function because two ordered pairs have the same first element. And the next one we would say the set of ordered pairs does represent a function because the ordered pairs have different first elements. Okay. Alright, example two. It says create a table showing the cost of movie tickets. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's say, let's use a nice ballpark figure here that uh, for one ticket, let's see, the movie theater costs you ten dollars. Okay. Two tickets then would therefore be twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, and then sixty dollars for six tickets. Now what we have to do here, where they talk about the variable right here, they're asking should it be independent or a dependent. Well, how you always determine which is going to be independent or dependent is think how something is dependent on the other. Is the number of tickets purchased dependent on the cost, or is the cost dependent on the number of tickets? So like, is it like you go to the movie theater and they say $60, so it means you purchase six? Or do you go and ask them, I would like six tickets and it costs $60? Since it's the second one right there, we say that the number of tickets purchased is independent. And the cost is dependent on the number of tickets purchased. All right. As a result, this side's going to be your domain, essentially your x values, and this is your range over here. Now they ask a couple questions about this. Is this relation a function? Well, I would say yes. All right. Now, why would we say yes? Well, notice that each term in this set maps on to directly one in the other set. That's a big thing. So we would say each element in the domain, domain being your left set right there, is associated with only one element oops, in the range. If that ever happens, then you know you're good to go as far as functions go. Okay. Identify the independent and dependent variables. We did that. We're good to go. Now we explain why. I explained because um, basically the total cost depends on the total number of tickets, so that's why the total cost is your dependent, and the number of tickets purchased is your independent. Now I want you to actually specifically write what the domain and range is. Well, in this case, we would write the domain is the set of numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So notice how I use my set notation. And my range for this one, of course, was 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60. Okay. Now, that's just assuming, though, that that is the entire table. If this went on forever, we would say um, this is the set of natural numbers. And if it went on forever, we could just put dot, dot, dot right there to represent that it goes in that same, um, same kind of pattern. And the last thing they want you to do here is graph the function. So this is why I also include a little bit from the uh, 5.4 stuff on graphing. Um, the graph says, uh, graph the function, so let's do that first. We'll go ahead and graph this thing and then we'll answer the question to ask. So the graph is the cost of movie tickets. I'll just label my graph. And we have total cost over here. Okay, actually I shouldn't have used a number sign, I should use money. And then down here we should have the number of tickets. So now let's just label this. This will be 0, 0. These will go up by one at a time. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Actually, let's uh, space out a little bit more. So let's try and use as much space as we can. We have 1, 2, 
three, four, five, and six. That spreads it out a little bit nicer. So try to use the amount of space that you're given. And the total cost here, I'll go up by tens on this side. We have 20, or 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60. Okay, so if we graph this, you would have what we call a nice linear function. We'll get into that in the next unit. Um, that would look something like so. All right, and of course that could keep going. Of course, if you bought seven tickets, it would be um, seventy dollars. Now, this is the big question, and this is kind of the most important part of the unit uh, or of the section, I should say. Do you connect the points? Should I make this line look something like so and connect all those dots? Go and put a line through them. That's the question. Now, think about this for a second. Well, would you want to connect those points? Think about what that would mean. That would mean that theoretically you could, if I graph this, okay, let's say that we did have a nice straight line. That would mean that this would represent that point right there, that to buy 1.5 tickets, it would cost you $15. Now, I don't know what 1.5 tickets really looks like. Does that mean you're going with Mr. Johnson because I'm only like half a person because I'm really short? I don't know. Um, because that doesn't make any sense, this is an example of something that is considered, and you need to make sure you write this down, is considered discrete data. All right. So since it's discrete data, what we do is we don't connect the points. All right. And the reason we don't connect them is points in between are meaningless. All right. Now the opposite of discrete uh, data, I should probably get rid of this line since I'm saying we shouldn't deal with it. here, here, and here, and here. So the opposite of discrete data is that we have continuous data. And I'll give you some examples in case you're wondering um, how to figure out if something is continuous or not. Uh, continuous data, we would say we want to connect points. Okay. And just the opposite of the other one, the points in between are meaningful. And that's usually what I just ask myself always. Does it make sense to include this point, let's say right in the middle right there, yes or no? Okay, an example of continuous data would be, let's say we are traveling from uh, Kelowna to Vancouver and we have time down here and we have distance traveled over here. So no matter what happens, time is always continuous, right? So as my vehicle, let's say, keeps going, it may be traveling further and further, maybe we stop so it's not really going much further, and then we travel further and further and further like so. Maybe we're going at different paces. That's why the graph's moving like so. Time is always continuous. It's always counting on four. So that's why we would say that we could count every one of these little points along this graph. Okay. So that's the difference between continuous and discrete data. To recap this lesson, the first thing that we learned was kind of about domain and range. Domain is your x value, is also known as your independent variable. Uh, the range is your dependent variable, that's going to be the y values. Domain and range we're going to be talking about all the way through high school math. All right. We also talked about on this last page uh, the difference of something being discrete. Discrete is when the points uh, do not make sense to connect, and continuous is when they do make sense to connect. That concludes this lesson.